Hello everyone and welcome to week 11 of English 121. This week you're going to watch this lecture first which is about figures of speech and poetry. Then you're going to watch the video on the interactive text on figures of speech which will enhance your understanding of figures of speech. Then I'd like you to read chapter 18 in our text on figures of speech. Okay. There will be a conversation um, where you will look at um, and analyze the, fig the examples of figures of speech. Um, and then in your reflection journal, you're going to find a poem and analyze it based on its use of, of figures of speech. I'm also going to introduce your second paper. Um, many of you have already had a chance to uh, speak with me about your first paper, and everyone's gotten their papers back. Uh, I wanted to give you ample time to start researching your second paper, though it's not due for quite some time. So what are figures of speech? Figures of speech are the tools of poetry. Um, they're, they're really, um, they occur whenever a speaker or writer, for the sake of um, you know, freshness or, or emphasis, um, departs from the usual denotations of words. Um, and, really kind of calls upon all the connotations around a word. There's two main figures of speech that poets use. There's metaphor, which is a statement that um, one thing is something else directly, which in the literal sense it's not. Um, and there's simile, which is a comparison of two things indicated by some connective word, usually the words like or as. And the two things need to be um, that are being compared are usually dissimilar in some way. Metaphors can, can make associations between two unlike things that are broad and contain many different aspects, whereas a simile usually is something much more specific. This is a poem by Sylvia Plath um, called Metaphors that is talking about the state of being pregnant using metaphors. I'm a riddle in nine syllables, an elephant, a ponderous house, a melon strolling on two tendrils. Oh, red fruit, ivory fine timbers, this loaf's big with its yeasty rising. Money's new minted in this fat purse. I'm a means, a stage, a cow and calf. I've eaten a bag of green apples, boarded the train. There's no getting off. So if you look at each of these, it's a, um, uh, each of them are a metaphor for being pregnant, and she's playing with the whole idea throughout this poem. Um, a lot of poets use figurative language. In fact, it's one of the building blocks of poetry. We're going to take a look at um, My Life Had Stood a Loaded Gun by Emily Dickinson, found on page 774. If you have the text open in front of you when I'm reading it to you, I think that'll really help you think about it. My life had stood a loaded gun. This was written by Emily Dickinson um, around 1863. My life had stood a loaded gun in corners till a day. The owner passed identified and carried me away. And now we roam the sovereign wo woods and now we hunt the doe, and every time I speak for him, the mountains straight reply. And do I smile such cordial light upon the valley glow? Is It is as a Vesuvian face had let its pleasure through. And when at night, our good day done, I guard my master's head, tis better than the eider duck's deep pillow to have shared. To foe of his, I'm deadly foe, none stir the second time, on whom I lay a yellow eye or an emphatic thumb. Though I, though I than he may longer live, he longer must than I, for I have but the power to kill without the power to die. So if you go back through this poem, which is set up on a metaphor, um, my life had stood a loaded gun, the idea of a life being like a loaded gun. Um, you can unpack this entire poem, and poem based on it. Um, you should, if you're looking through it, you want to look at all the illusions that come up, the Vesuvian face, um, which is Vesuvia. Um, Vesuvian is something you should look up and know um, 
what that's alluding to, or the Eider Ducks Deep Pillow is going to tell you something about that. Um, those are things you should look up. But look, think about this poem in regards to how it's playing with the, um, the association that we don't usually make between a, a, um, a day, uh, a, a life, right, a life versus a loaded gun, and how she's able to play with that space because she's making that broad, almost ridiculous statement. Um, and also how it makes sense that a life could be like a loaded gun. So think about that when you're thinking through this poem. On page 1126, um, Shakespeare is making fun of a Petrarchian conceit um, called the blazon. I'm not sure if I've talked to you guys about that yet, but um, before Shakespeare, Shakespeare started writing sonnets, um, the person who really invented the sonnet is um, Petrarch, and he wrote all of these um, sonnets for um, Lara in, in a sequence of poems called um, Rhyme Sparse. And, um, in all of these poems, uh, he never actually talked to Laura. Um, he just wrote poem after poem for her. And he would put her on a pedestal. He would say, your eyes are like suns, your, your hair is like gold. And, you know, he would talk about the parts of her and how beautiful she was, but never actually knew who she was. And so William Shakespeare um, use, <laughs> uses that, I, that conceit, right, and plays with it with his, with his poem. My mistress' eyes are nothing like the sun. This is Sonnet 130. My mistress' eyes are nothing like the sun. Coral is far more red than her lips red. If snow be white, why, then her breasts are done. If hairs be wires, black wires grow on her head. I have seen roses damask, red and white, but no such roses see I in her cheeks. And in some perfumes is there more delight than in the breath that from my mistress reeks. I love to hear her speak, yet well I know that music hath a far more pleasing sound. I grant I never saw a goddess go. My mistress, when she walks, treads on the ground. And yet, by heaven, I think my love as rare as any she belied with false compare. So, by using simile, my mistress eyes are nothing like the sun. He's, he is re, he's looking at each part of the, the mistress that had been um, before pulled apart and making a much more human picture of what his mistress is like. She's actually a real person, right? And he does that through the use of um, simile. Another wonderful poem by Shakespeare is Sonnet 18, Shall I Compare Thee to a Summer's Day? Um, looking at the timelessness of love. Let's talk a little more about other figures of speech. Another very important figure of speech is personification. Um, personification is a figure of speech in which a thing or an animal or an, a um, or an abstract term is made human. Um, an example is found on page uh, 779, the wind, um, where the wind is given, um, it's animated into, it's given human qualities. The wind. The wind stood up and gave a shout. He whistled on his fingers and kicked the withered leaves about and thumped the branches with his hand and said he'd kill and kill and kill and so he will and so he will. That's found on page, on page 779. When um, in apostrophe, uh, it's when you address something that isn't normally spoken to. So if you look at page 780, um, Robin, Robinson Jeffers, who wrote this poem in 1929, a wonderful California poet, um, addresses uh, something in hands uh, that isn't usually address addressed. Hands. Inside a cave in a narrow canyon near Tassajara, the vault of rock is painted with hands. A multitude of hands in the twilight, a cloud of men's palms, no more. No other picture. There's no one to say whether the brown, shy, quiet people who are dead intended religion or magic or made their tracings in the idleness of art. But over the division of years, these careful signs, manual, are now like a sealed message, saying, look, we are also human. We had hands, not paws. All hail you people with the cleverer hands, our supplanters, in the beautiful country. Enjoy her season, her beauty, and come down and be supplanted.
for you also are human. So you can ident you can identify both personification and apostrophe in um, hands. Uh, it's you're getting an address, uh, something's being addressed, um, and something's speaking back, given human qualities, um, namely the picture of the hands in this in this uh, poem. So both are being used. Um, finally, her hyperbole is very important. It's the idea of overstatement, and this is very, very common in poetry. It's a way to make a, a you know, to, um, we use it all the time in conversation. You know, I, I told them a thousand times, right? Or I told my kids to clean their room 50,000 times, right? We use these kinds of figures of speech in our everyday language, but in poetry, um, it's used as a way to really emphasize something. And one of the most famous acts of hyperbole is found in an ancient poem by um, Catullus. And Catullus was a Roman poet. This is Carmen V. Carmen in Latin means poem, so poem five. Let us live, my lesbia, and let us love, and let us judge all the rumors of the old men to be worth just one penny. The suns are able to fall and rise, when that brief light has fallen for us, we must sleep a never-ending night. Give me a thousand kisses, then another hundred, then another thousand, then a second hundred, and then yet another thousand more, then another hundred. Then, when we have made many, when we have made many thousands, we will mix them all up so that we don't know, and so that no one can be jealous of us when he finds out how many kisses we have shared. So obviously, the hyperbole is in the amount of kisses that are, at, that are added up in this poem. When you write about figures of speech, um, you want to you wanna write effectively about um, a metaphorical poem. You start considering the general scope of the key metaphor. Before you begin to write, you want to clarify which aspects of the comparison are true and which are false. Uh, what are the two things being compared? Make a list of metaphors and key images in the poem. Notice whether there are obvious connections among all the metaphors or similes of the poem. So when you're doing your uh, reflection journal this week, I want you to use this checklist. Um, underline a poem's key com comparisons. Look for both similes and metaphors. How are the two things being compared alike? In what ways are the two things being compared alike? Do the metaphors or similes in the poem have anything in common? And if so, what does that commonality suggest? So in your conversation this week, you're going to be talking about what is similar. Um, each of the quotations on page 778 uh, contains a simile or a metaphor. Um, you'll see it on page 778. It says, exercise, what is similar? Um, I'd like you to choose one of the eight examples posted on the, on the page and answer the following questions about that example. In each of these figures of speech, what two things is the poet comparing? Try to state exactly what you understand the two things have in common, the most striking similarity or similarities that the poet sees. Try and choose examples that have not already been written about so that as a class we write about all eight examples. Please post your initial post by 11.59 p.m. on Friday night and respond to at least three of your peers' posts by Monday at 11.59 p.m. And I want to remind you that when you respond to your peers' posts, many of you are doing an excellent job with this, but when you respond, you want to make sure that you're adding to the conversation. So don't just say, hey, I really liked how you talked about uh, Swinburne's uh, comparison in Atlanta and Caledon. I thought that was really good. I want you to take it further, so um, find a way to add to the conversation. Find a way to contribute your own opinion about the particular piece of writing that he or she is writing about. Um, finally, this week I'd like you to write a reflection journal where you write about the figures of speech found in a poem. Choose a poem from the chapter that we haven't already discussed, so this is from chapter 18, and write a response where you introduce the poem and the poet who wrote the poem, and then you examine how the author is using figures of speech in his or her poem. When I say introduce the poet or the poet who wrote the poem, I want you to read up on the biography about that poet. You must refer to at least three different figures of speech in your response 
that means you need to refer to metaphor, simile, and personification, or metaphor, uh, hyperbole, and personification. So three different ones um, in order to re receive credit for this reflection journal. Use your examination of the different figures of speech in order to find a meaning in the poem. So use what, you're, what you've discovered, just like you did when you were looking up the illusions. Use what you discovered to really help you um, examine what the meaning of the poem is. I do want to start drawing your attention to a chapter we're going to be talking about next week, which is how to write about poetry. Um, it's in the back of the book, um, we have chapter 43 is writing about a poem. And before you begin any poetry writing assignment, including these short poetry assignments we do in class or you know online for our conversations and reflection journal, you want to first choose a poem that speaks to you so that you feel some sort of emotional connection to and allow yourself time to get comfortable with your subject. So spend time reading the poem. Don't just read it once, read it a couple times, as many of you have learned. Then I want you to read actively and read the poem many times. Try reading the poem aloud. That really helps you understand a poem. And annotate the poem. So see the example on page 1934, there's an example of what annotation looks like. It's writing all over the poem in order to understand it. Look up any unfamiliar words or references and allusions and make sure you understand them in the context of the poem. Spend time thinking about the poem. Let your emotions guide you into the poem. Determine what is literally happening in the poem. Remember when we did that where you rephrase what's happening in the poem. Ask what it all means. Um, what's the purpose of the poem? Consider the poem's shape on the page and the way it sounds. What are the line breaks? Um, how many syllables per line? Is it written in a form, like a sonnet? There's two different ways that you can write about poetry that, that are brought forward in this chapter. First is comparison and contrast. That places two poems side by side and then studies their differences and similarities in order to shed light on both works. It'll pair two poems with much in common and point to further unsuspected resemblances show noteworthy differences and carefully consider uh, and you really need that when you're writing this type of paper you need to carefully consider your paper's organization um, and we'll talk about that some more next week. Analysis is separating the poem into elements as a means to understand that subject. So you're going to look closely at one or two elements or probably um, more such as figures of speech, sound, or imagery and show how this element of the poem contributes to the meaning of the whole poem. So just like when you were arguing a theme in the short stories that you were writing about, um, in this case you will be arguing the meaning of a poem. What is the poem about? And you'll use figures of speech or sound or imagery or word choice as a way to explain um, that meaning. And there's a sample paper on page 1946 of an analysis paper and there's a sample paper of a comparison and contrast paper on page 1948. When you, when you write about poetry, you'll need to quote it. And there's some very important information on, found on pages 1950 to 1952 um, that show you what it's like to quote poetry. Um, when you quote a few lines of poetry, just, uh, just a few, you want to transform the passage into the prose form. If you use a slash, that indicates a line break, and if you use a double slash, that indicates a stanza break. Um, here's an example. The color white preoccupies frost. The spider is, and this is a quote from the poem, fat and white. And the line here indicates a line break on a white heel all. And the line, the, the, the numbers one to two are the line numbers of the poem. And even the victim moth is pale, too. If you're quoting four or more lines, you want to set the lines off from your text and arrange them just as they occur on the page, white space and all. So you're going to indent one inch from the left-hand margin. You're going to double space between quoted lines. <coughs> Excuse me. You're going to type the poem exactly as it appears in the original. You do not need to use quotation marks. And you're going to cite the line numbers you're quoting in parentheses after the quotation. Here's an example. At the end of the poem, the poet asks what deity or fate cursed this particular mutant flower. With being white, the wayside blue and innocent helal, what brought the kindred spider to that height? 
then steered the white moth thither in the night. Um, things to think about is omitting words. You want to um, uh, quoting only a brief phase, um, phrase and omitting full lines. And there's more information about this on pages 1950 to 1952. Um, and we will be talking about this more next week. Just want to get this conversation started. Practice quoting poems in your uh, reflection journal and your um, uh, conversation this week. When you're getting ready to write, um, and you will be writing beginning next week, you want to write a rough draft first. Um, begin with pre-writing. Um, I, I recommend, and there's information on this, pages 1935 to 1938, something like brainstorming for 15 minutes can help you think through something, read the poem a bunch of times, and then brainstorm, let yourself um, free associate ideas or free write for 15 minutes, just write everything in your brain, uh, cluster ideas, make a list, create an outline. Um, then once you've got some main ideas, what you think your thesis is going to be, so what the meaning of the poem is you're going to be arguing or what, um, why you're going to be comparing and contrasting two poems, you want to review your purpose and audience. Why do you want to make this comparison? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Why do you want to make this comparison? Or um, uh, for what purpose? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, you want to supply evidence to prove your point. And you want to um, organize your argument um, and concentrate on getting your ideas onto the page. So here's your prompt. Excuse me while I get some water. Um, paper two will be writing about poetry. You're going to write a five to six page paper at Times New Roman 12 point font and it will be in MLA format on one of the following prompts. Compare and contrast any two poems by a single poet found in our textbook. Possible poets include Auden, Blake, Cummings, Dickinson, Dunn, Elliot, Hardy, Hopkins, Hughes, Keats, Shakespeare, Stevens, Whitman, Williams, Yates, and many others. Just um, let me know if you want to choose somebody else. Or you can write an analysis of a poem of your choice where you research the poem, the poet, the context of the poem and argue a meaning based on your research. You have to find uh, you can find good biographies of all the poets featured in our book at poets.org or the Poetry Foundation. All papers must use direct quotations from the poems and show an understanding of the terminology we've been learning in regards to the elements of poetry. Papers due November 10th at 11:59 p.m. All right, guys, that's it for this week. I apologize for the longish lecture, but I want to make sure you guys. Or you have ample time to really start to think about writing the next paper. I urge you to stop by my office hours if you have questions. I'm here on Mondays and Wednesdays from 12.30 to 3, but I'm also here at other times if you'd like to make an appointment. Those times don't work for you. Also, if you have any questions about things like MLA formatting or something like that, please just come and talk to me and I'll, I'll get you to um, some more resources or help you understand it. All right, guys, that's it. I look forward to seeing you online.